Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's, it's uh, MNR Wednesday, and it gives me absolutely great pleasure to have uh, Barry Nayrod uh, talking to us today. Um, but before I introduce Barry, uh, let me just uh, remind some of, the, some of you who may have come here directly from the, uh, the registration link, that if you go to the MTNet MNR page, and the link's down at the bottom there, you'll find links to uh, previous uh, MNRs where you can see the uh, recordings and the presentations. And there's uh, registration, there's only one more MNR left. Um, so we have one more MNR left, it's a special one. Uh, next week is the final one of the season. And we're having an open mic, which is an open discussion for up to two hours. It, it might last 10 minutes if no one's got any questions, it might last two hours if we have lots of questions. So please, uh, Please send your questions in that you want us to discuss, and then we'll be. It'll be a. It won't be a webinar. It'll be actually a, a, a Zoom meeting, so everybody will be able to see each other and speak and so on. And just a quick note: I asked the chat GPT what the collective noun is for a group of MT specialists, and chat GPT told me it's a flux. So here we have a flux of MT specialists, and this photo is actually from. The first EM induction workshop I went to in 1976 in uh, in Hungary, uh, and then we're st we're starting the new season, season four in October, and we're we're, we're seeking uh, people who wish to speak and ideas and topics. Uh, send these to anyone on the MNR team, myself, uh, Juliana, Lindsay, Max, or Stefan, or to the uh, MNR uh, email address mtnet.mnrs.gmail. But today, like I say, it gives me great, great, great pleasure to have uh, Barry Nayrod speak to us. And I've known Barry for a long time. We started working together in the late 80s as the Geological Survey Canada developed uh, the long period intelligent magnetotelluric system that um, used uh, Barry's uh, ring core flux gate as, as its magnetometer. And Barry worked with us on that design. And uh, Barry and I were in Tibet in, in uh, 95. Um, some good days <laughs> and some not so good days. So Barry's going to talk to us today on low noise magnetic field measurements using copper permalloy uh, fluxate cores. Very brief uh, CV from Barry. Got his uh, geophysics and glaciology of all things uh, in 79 at UBC. And uh, since 84 has been operating uh, NAROD geophysics, providing fluxate magnetometers all over the world, including Canada. I believe we were uh, I'm not sure, Barry, maybe uh, GSC was your first customer. Or not. Actually, the second. <laughs> second customer. Yes. USA, Australia, Brazil, and so on. Uh, Earthscope has got a huge amount of Barry's uh, systems. Been a, is a member of uh, Engineers and Geoscientists BC and is an adjunct professor of geophysics in the uh, University of British Columbia. So at that, Barry, I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll hand over to you and invite you to... Uh, present us your, your talk. Thank you. Everybody can hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I've been working in this field for a long time, trying to figure out what makes a good magnetometer. Oops, let's not do that. And I'm just going to clean up my screen here a bit. There we go. Uh, the, so I started working on, on uh, materials for magnetometers in the in 1980s. Uh, and it's only recently that I feel I finally made a breakthrough on these materials, particularly with these copper materials that I've been working on recently. My uh, co-worker on this is a fellow named David Miles, who's now a tenured professor at the uh, University of Iowa. He was my student. He did his PhD in uh, University of Alberta on these subjects. And we have uh, split up the work in developing magnetometers and materials and some joint work on these things as well. Uh, but uh, hopefully, David, in the future, will be able to take a lot of this forward in, uh, in new and interesting directions. Okay, there we go. So, permaloys. What 
is a permalloy? Why do we care about it? Again, I have to clean up my screen. Okay, permalloys originated in 1923 as a ferromagnetic alloy of nickel and iron. They were invented by uh, Gustav Elman at Bell Labs at the time. Uh, over the years, different recipes have been uh, created using third materials and fourth materials, uh, molybdenum, copper, chromium being the, the, the commonest of the three, uh, the commonest three others as well. Our particular reason for being interested in permaloids is they've provided the lowest noise materials we have had for flux heat magnetometers and for induction coils as well, for that matter. And as uh, these low noise sensors, which we're using in all of the earth sciences, not just magnetotelluric surveys, but observatories and in spacecraft. At this time, there is no long term viable source of the lowest noise materials, permaloid materials. Uh, the last production terminated in uh, 1990. The materials were, in terms of uh, making make them into actual cores, terminated in 1996. That's more than half of my career already. It seems like not that long ago, but it's coming up on 30 years already. Uh, typically, these materials would get manufactured into a ring, such as the one I've shown on the right, but there are other shapes that can be used as well. My present examination of these materials has uh, concentrated on copper formalized, in which you've got nickel and iron and copper. Um, the work that I'm doing is can be very much thought of as a continuation of work done by Siemens and Halskin in Berlin uh, from the 19 in all all taken taken place in the 1930s, uh, and I'll be showing quite a bit more of that uh, research in a little bit. Um, our newest permaloys that we're working with right now are new in both configurations and materials, and should offer. Um, I've, I'm, I believe much improved performance compared with the now unavailable legacy uh, molybdenum, pure molybdenum materials. I am not getting a response on my keypad. do it this way. Um, so this is uh, an advertising page for the 19, the materials that were made in the US using 8% molybdenum permaloy, which were the basis of the all the magnetometers I've used in observatories and in MT systems, well, not all of them, but most of them uh, up until 1996, made by Infinetics. They, uh, they, they made these available to people like me from a 19, 81 through 1996, and then sent out a letter on 7th March 1996 that they were going end of line, and that was it. So certain groups such as uh, John Booker, University of Washington, and, and Chris Russell at uh, UCLA and a few others managed to you know, buy a stash to keep themselves going for a while, and that stash has been keeping us going forever since, but it's pretty well gone now and we got to really do something about that and that's what I've been trying to do for such a long time so to uh, make a breakout of this uh, I've uh, came to the, I've found that there have been two steps for me there have been two steps that have allowed me to move forward the first step was in you know, figuring out exactly what is causing noise in magnetometers. Uh, and I finally figured that out in the, between, you know, call it uh, 2010 and 2011. That ended up in this paper in 2014, this is the origin of noise and magnetic crystals in our flux gate sensors. And the core result of that paper, and if you, I recommend going to dig this one out if, uh, if you're interested, is this equation, which I've outlined in red. And I'll get back to that equation in a, in, a, in a little while. What happens in a permaloy is the uh, magnetic domains, such as the ones that are, are visualized here, 
uh, organize themselves into stripes. In, in this case, uh, alternating stripes with the magnetization either pointing left or pointing right. And so these two images are actually obverse and uh, front of uh, a, a disc 13 millimeters in diameter showing what strike domains look like. And these, these are continuous through the material. So what happens to these domains is what determines the noise in these, in these materials. So inside the, the strike domains, you, this is, I'm now trying to present a cross section of, of what, the, what the domains are, are looking like. So bottom left here in section A, you have a set of strike domains. Polarization now here is in and out of the plane of the screen. Uh, and this kind of a configuration occupies a point about here in the BH loop. As you drive this thing into mag through magnetization, which is one of the things you have to do in a flux gate, you, you stress the domains to the point where they're going to break at this point here. And at this point, it will then jump to a different configuration of domain, which I've called channel domains as opposed to stripe domains. But the surface expression of these two are identical. You don't actually can't actually visualize these uh, this change on the surface, but you can sure see it in the in the in the BH curves. Uh, is this jump, this irreversible jump from this domain configuration to this domain configuration that actually creates the noise that uh, flux gates experience, and it's um, proportional to the energy available in that uh, that that jump, and the, and the energy is is localized in the surfaces of the domain walls. And so the more surface area you have uh, being reconnected from, from B to C, the more noise you're going to get. Um, and it's not just in the in the side the domains themselves that the surface matters. It matters on the, the surface of the foil over here because they're actually tied together by physical principles. So here are uh, some noise data from two sets of uh, Legacy infinitics rings. The blue ones over here are, are rings in which the foils are three microns thick, and the red ones over here are foils in which the uh, are twelve microns thick. And all other parameters have been kept the same in these ones. But here you can see that the thin foils, which have four times as much surface area, have four times the noise of the foils, which have the twelve micron. Uh, things that have the 12 micron falls. So noise is very much controlled, at least in one parameter, by the surface area available, which is not exactly a magnetic property, simply surface. Okay, so back to this equation. Uh, ED here, I've uh, used as a symbol to represent the domain wall energy in the system, which gets connected to magnetostatic energy and every other kind of things. It's all, they're all tied together. It turns out if you crank through the first principles of how these things work, it's a function of four parameters uh, in material. I've just shown you thickness, foil thickness is one of the parameters. And here it's got a negative exponent, which means that as the thickness gets uh, smaller, the, the, the main wall energy gets higher and, the, and the, uh, the noise goes up. So the fact that in phonetics, was using 12 micron foils for all those years is actually been doing us a disservice. Uh, it's pretty clear going forward from here that the, that was too thin a foil. Uh, newer sensors are likely to use thicker foils. And um, as a result, from that, that's one control on making these things quieter. Alpha over here is a, just a symbol I've used for the crystal alignment. There's been a little bit of study to demonstrate that if you can get the magnetic alignment of these crystals uh, more along the direction you want to measure things, it's going to do better. The last two parameters, BS is the saturation moment. And for quite a long time now, we've all the community has known that if you can if you can reduce the saturation moment, you, you can reduce the noise. And the last term here is the total magnetic anisotropy. Um, which reflects in parameters such as initial permeability or corrosivity. If you can get those numbers better, you get lower noise as well. And that's been also known for a long time. So this, this is the control over everything in regards to, to designing an instrument with, uh, with to, get, to get to lower noise. The second part of the, uh, 
breakout to make this happen was finding this paper from 1935 by uh, Otto von Auers and Hans Neumann, uh, who worked at, then at Siemens. It was published in 1935. There's been a, there was a group working at Siemens in the 1930s. Um, there is an absolute ton of mag magnetic material data in this paper, and it was a very hard paper to find. Uh, there was almost no citations of it. Um, with uh, some degree of luck, I managed to get my hands on this uh, this one in, in, in 2007. So I actually knew about copper permaloids as interesting magnetic materials before I had the, the, the break on the understanding of how magnetometer noise works. But these two uh, discoveries, finding this paper, figuring out the physics, come together to allow me to, to move forward now in, in new and interesting directions on low noise materials. Now I'm gonna go into a little bit, the, some of the data inside that uh, 1935 paper. In that study, these two fellows created 130 copper alloys. Uh, each of them were seven kilogram ingots. And if you just add all that up, think you're going to be paying a dollar a gram for those materials, which is what we pay for them now. That's a million dollars worth of uh, metal that went into this experiment. The compositions uh, that ours and Neumann used are shown in the left triangle here as little O's and X's. Um, and I've overlaid it here with the a set of uh, alloys that uh, we have created in our present study. Now, some of the features on this drawing are sh show up here as curves, various curves, which um, ours and Neumann uh, published as estimates of a region where they were getting uh, segregation, me mechanical segregation of their elements into different, into different uh, uh, crystal types and creating um, permanent magnetization. So this was an area they ended up trying to avoid looking for for high permeability materials. Uh, the right triangle is uh, uh, their uh, contour plot of initial permeability for a, a, a very slow cooled uh, heat treatment. And uh, I've marked on here in two red dots, the range of alloys that we have ended up using to, to study this, this zone of copper alloys, trying to stay within this high permeability zone. There's also a line that goes down here through the middle, which is a zero magnetostriction line, uh, which also plays into the high permeability, uh, low anisotropy properties. But on the high iron side over here, you can see it bleeds into this um, segregation area pretty quickly. And on the other side, it, it falls off pretty quickly too. So the, the interesting zone was, pretty narrow and we've actually chosen a set of alloys with about a 5% spread. Uh, this figure on the right, the triangle shows the same red dots and the same left triangle, but now I'm showing the saturation induction that were uh, contoured by ours and Neumann and the red dots again show the range of uh, values over which we're likely to find interesting properties from about 600 millitesla down to about 200 millitesla saturation induction. And again, you can see it falling off fairly quickly as the ion disappears from it and getting into strange properties over here as you get into the segregation zone. Into some of the data. So here I show all the different alloys we made. Each, for each alloy, we made a 30 gram ingot. These were melted in, in Iowa by David um, and then sent, sent it here to, to Vancouver for me to roll them and process them into testable materials for magnetic properties. David took several of these materials, the ones that I've outlined in, in red circles, and actually built magnetometer sensors out of them so we could compare performances of, of these with each other and with the legacy materials. Uh, in addition to just building sensors with these, I've also measured the uh, Curie temperature of these four specimens in order to get a range of, uh, uh, get a handle on what the Curie temperature range of these things were. So the each specimen is marked by color. The 42 
represents, and this one represents uh, the copper content, the 52 represents the nickel content. So on the left, uh, we see going increasing downwards, the nickel content and on, on up top here, we can see going to the right, we have copper increasing. So the, the, the one on the furthest right was 45% copper, 50% nickel, the remainder is 5% iron. Uh, the color indicates uh, how much the iron is in this case. So we made altogether about 50 of these specimens uh, and rolled them to, to various thicknesses and made them into various uh, forms for various uh, parameter measurements. First up, um, resistivity. Uh, the far left the has the lowest uh, resistivity values here 2.86 as also the highest the lowest copper content so copper isn't is is not a control on uh conductivity it turns out that the mix the closer you get to a 50 50 mix of of these kinds of materials the higher the resistivity is going to be um the original investigation found that the high conductance of these materials for the low copper contents was actually a problem for them. And they were trying to make transformers and motors and uh, inductors and so on. They, that was actually turned out to be a big problem for them. And that was ultimately why these copper alleys for their application never went any further. But for our the application, the rules are entirely different. And we ended up wanting to have lower saturation moment. We want to have higher resistivities which we can be achieved can be achieved with the higher co copper contents. In fact, these numbers are similar to the uh, resistivities that you'll find in the in the typical commercial uh, perme uh, per permaloids, the molypermaloids, which have a range of four to five to six uh, 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 ten to times seven by seven meters. So very comparable on resistivity in areas which we are ultimately going to find fairly interesting. Okay, saturation moment. Um, as expected, the lowest copper content is going to ha has the highest saturation moment. These these numbers we have here: six hundred millitesla here, one hundred and ninety four uh, millitesla down on the right. Uh, color contouring here has the, the red tones being the low moments, and the blue tones and beige tones being the the high magnetic moments. This these data reflect what ours and Neumann found. Um, in their study pretty closely. One thing to point out, these black rectangles, which I've marked here, are the alloys that were made for the original hours of Neumann study. So if we're looking for things which ultimately are being resolved at the 1% level, their data are pretty coarse and we really needed to fill it in in order to find out what's really going on in this potentially interesting regime. Okay, next. Next up, we're going to Curie temperature. They took uh, the, the four alloys I pointed before, added to that the 6% uh, 81 nickel uh, legacy material that came from Infinetics and measured magnetic moment as a function of temperature and worked out what the Curie temperatures are. And I pl plotted them on one of these uh, spreadsheets as well. So if on the far right, you can see the 45, 50, 45% nickel, 45% copper, 50% nickel alloy had a, has a Curie temperature of 100 degrees, as does its neighbor here. And as you go up to higher and higher nickel contents, less, less copper, the Curie temperature goes up, as you might expect, as the, as the uh, saturation moment is, room temperature saturation moment is going up. Next data, these are our initial permeability. And um, there, I've highlighted in red boxes those which are locally high values all through here. And so the the ridge that uh, ours and Neumann had found in their permeability data, we've been able to replicate here and localize more carefully. And going forward, this is going to be how we're going to to look you now choose alleys for for further testing. We're pretty close now. But I think there's uh, some significant improvement still possible. Okay, uh, DC coercivity or zero hertz coercivity. These are the same. Uh, these are in amps per meter. 
uh, low values on the right, 3.5, 2.5 amps per meter. These are extremely low uh, coercivity values, even when compared with things like amorphous alloys. Uh, and the red boxes here are the highlights of the, the, the low coercivity. And they're the identical boxes as with this one. I've kept them all the same. And this is pretty good evidence that when you're looking at coercivity or you're looking at initial permeability, ultimately down inside this stuff, you're looking at the same, same property ultimately. That will pop out from the, the domain theory I've been working on as well. Okay, zooming in a little bit, um, the area in the green circle are the areas where I'm finding an, an in interesting things to look at. Um, and what I'm going to be showing you is a series of uh, BH loops, starting with this one here, which has 10 and going to 480, 2080, and so on down to here. These are all just 1% changes in contents, but I'm see we're seeing huge changes in the actual ma uh, magnetic properties. So I, at 1%, I think we're just barely resolving the things that we're trying to find in, in this material exploration. Way over here, 600 something is the 4550L again, which was one of the ones we noise tested as was the 1880 one over here um, and the 2560. You should note that these two, 18, the, this one here and this one here are not local minima. So they actually are a little bit noisier than you might expect for the copper content. So we might be able to find better properties by going a little bit off the specimens that we've chosen so far. Okay, onto these actual BH loops. So up here, this is the 42% one, which had that relatively poor initial permeability. It's actually a permanent magnet if you look at its curves. Uh, it's, it's very square. Um, very, not, none of the rounded curves that, that I expect on a low noise material. So this one has clearly gone into that segregation area that I was, I was talking about earlier. Then you go from 42% to at 50 to 51 percent and it was just a one percent change you get this dramatic change and and some more curvature up here which is a sign of the good properties and as we go down to 40 to 52 down here the the, the loop is getting tighter uh, uh shrinking a little bit up here to uh 43 percent and then 40 percent and then the last one i've stuck down here is actually the 45 50 copper uh, permaloy curve that is ultimately our, at the moment our lowest noise material. Uh, whoops. These are the same rings uh, zoomed in, but these are just actual, just uh, photographic images from the oscilloscope. Top left on here is that permanent magnet I showed you before. And you can see now more clearly just how much change happens with a 1% change in material content. Uh, I, this one here, 4452, is almost non-magnetic. It's got the tiny coercivity. It's barely got any magnetic moment at all. Probably not a good candidate for a, a, um, a flexate because of it's likely to have some temperature sensitivities. This one here, 43% and 50, copper, 52% nickel, has a BH curve is about as close to the vacuum smelt, some amorphous materials that are being used for a lot of sensors now, as close to that as I can, uh, I've ever seen. Uh, coercivities of you know, three and a half amp per per meter, which is nominally smaller than what the vacuum smelts product, very low noise material, comparable saturation moment, comparable Curie temperature. Uh, it has one big advantage over the vacuum smelts material is that I can make this any thickness foil I want. Whereas vac the, the amorphous materials uh, are limited because of how they're manufactured to thicknesses below 20 microns. Okay, on to looking at what the actual noise performance of some of these things are. Uh, we started by sticking with the 6% molybdenum uh, reg legacy material and and making uh, magnetometers based upon 100 micron foils. Here you can see a ring with a, these 100 micron foils. And David uh, chose to develop a system of making 
ace tracks, so sensors rather than ring sensors, and it, which have ultimately proven to be quite a lot better. Here inside this uh, this uh, plastic case are, are uh, layers of uh, a foil washers cut into a racetrack shape with then the windings put on top of it. Uh, the, uh, doing this with uh, the, the 6% mine material produced a, uh, a noise spectrum like this one, for example, and to uh, to compare that with the intermagnet data standard, which has 10 picotesla per root hertz at, at 0.1 hertz here, this even this 6% um, moly material is now well below the, inter the requirements, uh, the worst requirement for the intermagnet standard. Uh, again, this is this is because of, of both going to the thicker foils and going to the racetrack design. So as a reference point, we can now go from here on to looking at what the copper materials do. The dots here are the, the noise uh, spectral power spectral density at uh, 0.1 hertz and 1 hertz respectively in red and blue for the 6-8% Molly legacy material here. And then the four copper materials we tested starting with the 28% copper and going up to the 45% copper. First thing to note is that uh, all of the copper alloys that we chose to test are quieter than the legacy material. Further, as you go from 28% up to 45% copper, it gets quieter, both at 0.1 Hertz and at one Hertz. And the numbers down here are, are just our record setting, low noise. These are just a few, you know, you know, six picotesla uh, per root hertz for such a small sensor is a, is a pretty record setting. David then went on and, and made a, a, a larger collection of these 45% um, copper permaloys, tested them at 0.1 hertz and at one hertz. And here he's plotted a, a distribution of the, uh, of the, the results measured at these frequencies. The, Pink histogram is a, is a, shows the the data for the 0.1 hertz, and the blue histogram uh, shows the data for uh, one hertz. And the, you can see that the typical a typical uh, noise at one hertz for a, a, a one of these racetrack sensors is about five picoteslas, and typical noise for 0.1 hertz is about seven or eight picotesla. And I should note, these are for a single sensor core, each core 35 millimeters long, or 30 millimeters long, 30 millimeters long for the actual core material. Okay, so David has gone on to, uh, with his students to build uh, usable three component sensors with uh, two, two of these cores per channel. This is uh, this, a sensor, a photograph of one of the sensors they've made. It's been uh, named a Tesseract sensor. It has three equivalent uh, feedback coils in the form of merit coils. And you can see these little rectangles here on the end, two here, two here, and, and there's two on top. These are actually little drawers where you can slide the cores in or take them out as, as is required. So each channel has two sensors in it, not one. And as a result, there is that 3 dB improvement that you can expect from using two instead of one. So that when I said there was a five, typical five picotesla per root hertz for in the previous slide, by the time you, you, you uh, get to using two cores, you're down to three and a half picotesla. For me, I can't measure that. My lab's too noisy now to be able to see that. And Dave's struggling to be able to prove that he gets that kind of numbers. Uh, environmental contamination makes these kind of tests quite hard to do. To, hard to do. One of these sensors, actually two of these sensors flew um, last year, last fall, on a sounding rocket. So these, uh, these, these guys now have uh, space heritage. And I'm hoping to get uh, several of these made and get into the hands of the observatory people for testing at uh, NEMIG and other of their, their primary observatories. And I'd also like to get uh, a bunch of these into your hands to test in long period MT systems. David will take care of uh, getting them into space all by himself.
I am having trouble with my computer. There we go. So to summarize this part of the uh, presentation, the copper poems, um, as we have now found them, compare very favorably to the traditional 6% molypermaloids that were in the legacy materials and even compared to 6% molypermaloid ring cores uh, that we have made ourselves. Uh, we're not done. The potential for future optimization, uh, there is there is potential for future optimization within the molybdenum alloy range and still within the copper alloy range. We haven't uh, exploited, I think, yeah, the, uh, the the best possible alloys we have. We have more work we need to do on these, but certainly getting to three, four picotesla per root hertz at uh, one hertz and say five to six picotesla per root hertz at one hertz, at point one hertz is already a done deal. Uh, the funding agencies that have uh, got Dave doing this, um, He's kind of busy right now. They just had to change PIs on one of their big projects. And so I'm not, he's not getting much work done at this time. Okay, I said to uh, Alan, I'd throw in some extra history stuff. So the question um, I've been asking myself for a long time is how come it was left to me to find copper permalloids to make low noise sensors out of? And uh, I, I started digging through the historical literature, trying to find what I could. And so I've co concocted a story, which I think is a fairly true. Um, and permalase all started with Gustav Elman at Bell Labs, who invented the, for the first molybdenum alloy, the permalloy. And Bell Labs then went on with uh, working with, worked by Richard Bolzarth, and both of these guys ended up moving over to the Naval, the Naval Ordnance Labs to work with this guy over here to, uh, to create materials for the mil military. Um, Victor Vacquier was the person who actually introduced the first quality flux eight magnetometer in 1941, even though it was in the, the sensor itself was invented five years earlier by Ashton Brenner and Gubal. And uh, his work, uh, informed directly the work by of Daniel Gordon at the Naval Ordnance Labs in the 1960s, the, which uh, ended up developing the uh, 681 legacy material that we used for 30 years. Um, everything else was done in Europe, and uh, it gets a little confusing there. George Kynath is a name I'd never found before until this year. Turns out to be a key player in all of this, uh, and uh, at, at Siemens in Berlin, and uh, eventually that work uh, moved down to vacuum smelts, which was a division of Siemens, and sort of disappeared for twenty years and didn't really start to pick up again until the nineteen sixties. At which point they had adopted the the Molly Permalloy approach that the U.S. had had adopted. Um, okay, so it all, sorry, it all started with uh, Gustav Elman. This is a, an image from his 1926 patent for the original permalloy. All this original work was done for uh, loading, the magnetic loading of, of, of uh, marine cables for, for telecommunications, transocean communications. Um, they, properties they wanted were very high linearity. Uh, and big, big saturation moments, um, exactly the prop properties of which uh, are, are terrible for, for a good flux rate sensor. The, the two are definitely opposed. In England, um, Stafford, Willoughby Stafford and Smith and uh, Joseph, Joseph, Henry Joseph Garnett, um, in order to avoid um, the patents, the Elman patents, uh, came up with an alloy uh, with about 5% copper in it. You can see here, uh, this would be in the 19, late 1920s. Um, but they also thought that copper was a key material for uh, making, getting good magnetic properties. Uh, and unlike the Americans, they thought that the addition of things like uh, molybdenum and chromium uh, were only good for trying to improve the, the electrical resistivity properties of the materials and, and not were not fundamental to the magnetic properties. But uh, molybdenum turned out to be pretty fundamental to magnetic properties as well. 
And that was an error on the part of both the, uh, the British investigators and the German investigators. Okay, back to George Kynath. Um, in 1932, he was at Siemens. He was head of the research enterprise at Siemens, uh, at uh, Siemensstadt in Berlin. Uh, he himself worked on molybdenum permaloids, and here are some of the earliest data in existence on high, high molybdenum content materials. Here he's got a 10% uh, moly with a Curie temperature of around 200. This might be a candidate for uh, fluxate magnetometers as well. Uh, the other fellows, ours and Neumann, would have been in his group working, working uh, uh, more or less for him, working on directly on, the, on coppers while he would be working on mollies. This all came to an end in 1937 when... George Kynath emigrated to the uh, to the U.S. with his Jewish wife, and uh, at that point, I can find no further work on magnetic materials at Siemens uh, until until vacuum smelts uh, got started up much later. Uh, while they were there in the 1930s, they did come up with this uh, magnetic alloy 1040, uh, which had 14 percent copper. This is now the highest copper alloy uh, in extent at the time. Uh, they, they included in this alloy 2% or 3% molybdenum in order to, again, to say to improve its resistivity. That forces a highly restricted choice of heat treatments because as soon as you add a fourth element like that, there's a risk of, of uh, crystal segregation, which happens very quickly. And that's, uh, that's as far as it went. Okay, so finishing up uh, the the work in uh, copper permaloids came to a full stop in 1937, partly because the top guy at uh, at the Siemens operation headed out of the country, and partly because they these materials weren't suitable getting coming up with suitable properties for the things that they were trying to do, which were transformers and motors and other things which require high energy density. Um, in, the, in the US, uh, the molybdenum alloy work uh, continued being developed. It, uh, it migrated from, from the US to Germany, directly to uh, uh, Friedrich Pfeiffer's uh, work at vacuum smelts, which then informed uh, Gordon's work and came up with their final material, 6% of 6% uh, molypermolate, at which point everything froze. There's been no work done on this stuff ever since. So that's my understanding of why it got left to me. There was, uh, it all froze, copper in 1937, molybdenum in 1969. And until I come along with an idea of how to, to uh, come up with a more suitable material, nothing was going to happen. Last slide. Okay, um, this is on Molly Permalloy. This drawing is from Puzai in Moscow in 1962, considering ranges of new ranges of compositions in the, particularly the Molly Permalloys. Uh, this particular figure is the basis for everything that has happened ever since, including Pfeiffer's work at, at Siemens, including um, uh, Acuna's work at uh, at um, Naval Orange Labs and uh, everything else in the U.S. And it's based upon an assumption that, that we know what's going on inside this red circle, uh, but there are no data. So I wonder, I have to, due diligence says I'm going to have to go in, in here and investigate the Molly system as well, the same way I've investigated, investigated the copper system. Because uh, there may well be some nice surprises in there too. I don't know. Just have to do the work. And that's uh, the end. There's must be my story. Well, th thanks very much, Barry. It's absolutely phenomenal. I, I think one point to, uh, that really stands out is that those not in the field somehow think it's all known, it's all been done, and there's nothing new to find. And uh, particularly... Younger people today, 
think that all knowledge is is there. It just needs finding in Wikipedia or such. And yet your story shows us that there's there's a lot of fundamental knowledge that we don't have about things like this. Now, I think, I think that's, that's absolutely truth. tremendous. So um, I'll open it up to questions and we have a question already in. I'm going to read this out, Barry, so it gets in the record. Um, it's from uh, Leo Surov Surovitsky. Uh, it's three, three questions. Um, perhaps I'll just read them one at a time. Did you try to compare permeability of copper permaloid sensors with ones made of metaglass or other amorphous magnetically soft alloys? Uh, yes. I've been working with, I was one of the very first people to investigate these alloys starting in the 1980s. I was using those alloys to figure out that the magnetic moment is, is the key, per, one of the key parameters on, on, on reflexate properties. So yeah, I've been watching and comparing these materials for 40 years. So they're, they're front and center to everything I've done as well. Yeah, Leo's uh, second question, uh, the, the permalloy is still supposed to be annealed when used with copper? Or is it, make it a question, is the permalloy still supposed to be annealed when used with copper? Yes, the heat treatment is a big deal. I didn't go into any of that. I could go on to a whole hour just about heat treatments. Um, they're phenomenally fussy. And there's been a big learning curve for me in figuring that all out too. Yeah, and the, the third part, um, did you test uh, copper permalloy for racetrack and ring course sensor setups only, planar or single core gradiometers? We've done nothing on gradiometers. I've done nothing on gradiometers. I think some of the work at, at, at David's shop and I were the beginning to look at gradiometers. And uh, we tried various formats for racetracks, including wrapped racetracks and flat foil racetracks. And we ended up sticking with the flat foil racetracks. They're definitely superior to all the other, other forms we've taken. The other forms all end up having too much mechanical stress screwing things up. Yeah, uh, perhaps before I read the next question, just a comment that if anybody wishes to uh, have discussion and enter dialogue, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll make you, uh, I'll give you audio uh, uh, access. Um, so the next question from Mark Hunter, what was the bandwidth of the three component sensor that was built? I don't, have that number in my head but typically we've had bandwidths in several of several hundred hertz and we can put that anywhere we want depending on what the requirements are we can go up to kilohertz bandwidths if we need wow well, that's impressive and uh, a question from doug um that was excellent great um and i think we all think that has there been mathematical advancement to help predict how properties, even in your copper permaloids, could change with concentration? Only the and stuff I see, I've, Doug. I see your your, I would, your hand up. I tell only stuff I've done myself, which I've been able to come up with some first principles rules for um, working working out why all those things that we actually know from experience turn out to be. Uh, turn out to be correct theoretically as well. Uh, working out, being able to work out the, the exponents on these different uh, relationships between uh, design properties and performance, uh, for me has been a, a, a big motivation to go in certain directions. So that I don't know of anybody else doing this kind of theoretical work. Yeah, Doug, did you wanna say anything yeah, more? Just, I mean, it's just fascinating to me how uh, there are such big changes in your your final properties with just minute changes of even the concentration. Never mind trying to you know put in a new element. And so is it is it all kind of basically come down to you know clever people trial and error and just twiddle all of the possibilities here and then do the testing or is there some kind of mathematical physical basis that can help guide you uh both 
Uh, I mean, the math mathematical physical basis are, is only the, that which I have worked out for myself. And that was the 2010, 2014 paper. It's all in there. Um, that has been a guiding principle for what I've been doing. Uh, what, what if, uh, here's an example of the other. I was trying to, okay, 50 alloys. The initial package I designed was like 75 alloys. That's a lot of work making 50 alloys, processing every single one of them to get all these magnetic measurements. How can I minimize what I what I the effort in order to get the the result I want? And I was using that the theory to inform my experiment design on choose on how many alloys I need to minimum to 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 detect what I'm trying to detect. And uh, I came up by studying the hours of Neumann data that I have to get to 1% resolution in certain chemical directions on that, on that triangle. And I can get away with a bit less in other directions. So I tried to optimize the, the sampling, uh, taking into mind my, my theor theoretical understanding of that. I was also trying to you know, say how wide a spread do I need to go? Can I, am I going to be able to detect the uh, the um, the permanent magnetization regime that ours and Neumann intimated? Um, is the fall off at the low iron side going to be such that I don't really need to go very far in that direction? I I, I feel I did a pretty good job in the end of selecting the, a fifty alloy set, which really allowed me to to show what I was trying to find. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Um, Leo Sarovitsky, um, you, you had your hand up. I'm allowing you to talk. <clears throat> hi, Ellen. Hi, Barry. Thank you for interesting talk. And uh, I have a question. I asked uh, initially about uh, the uh, med glass or some uh, amorphous uh, alloys. Uh, and you told uh, that you compare them and uh, could you please describe briefly uh, like uh, which one is better and why because like I'm trying to create my own sensors and according to all new papers I found uh, the med glass and amorph like uh, any amorphous metals uh, kind of should be should work uh, better than uh, typical thermal permaloy or mu metals. Uh, the yes and no to that. The the once you can the no is because you're 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 stuck with a fixed thickness of the foil mm -hmm. at twenty microns or even less depending on the production batch. Uh, and I'm finding that for the the permaloys, if I if I were to make twenty micron foils and compare them directly to the met glass or vacuum smelts materials. Then yes, the uh, morphous alloys would be superior, but mm -hmm. I'm not comparing it. I have to comp I have to be able to throw in all the parameters. If I by working at the thicker foils of a hundred micron, mm -hmm. um, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. That is a big change going from uh, um, from twenty microns to hundred microns, and it shows up in both the theory and in, and in this and the sensors as a result. Um, so. Permaloids, I'm saying, are going are going to win because of this ability to make them any thickness you want, not because their inherent magnetic properties are superior to the amorphous. The amorphous ones are just as good. Okay, and uh, may I contact you personally later after this meeting? Uh, I have a couple questions. Maybe you will be able to answer them uh, regarding okay. to my sensors. Sure. Thank you. I've I've had this discussion with the, my colleagues in Ukraine as well, mm -hmm. Valery Karapanov and and um, Andrei Karapanov. Yeah, yeah. I I found a lot of his papers. Yeah, they uh, like uh, he made a lot in this yeah area. Yeah. About about ten years ago, we were you know, having coffee, and um, he he was trying to make a decision on where to where to go. He knew I had worked in amorphous alloys because I got papers on this on, on the subject but that, that I was switching back to crystalline permaloys um taking the uh, for him he thought it's a high risk move to develop all the furnaces and everything else that you need to work with permaloys and I just thought that in the end permaloys are going to win um and he 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 didn't say I was wrong 
but mm-hmm. he, he did say that he he wasn't prepared to put the investment in to be able to make it. It's it, permalizes are much more challenging to work with than 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 off the shelf amorphous materials. Okay, thank you, uh, Barry. Do, can I send your email address in the in the chat so people? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a question from Gunter Klitechka. Um, do you know what was the contribution from Mario Acuna's work to get the proper material for space research? Mario claimed that his cores were insensitive to temperature fluctuation. He used this material, for example, for the MGS mission. I don't know the inner workings of what uh, Mario did, uh, except a very little bit. I do know that by the time he joined Naval Ordnance Labs in 1969, 1969, the idea of um, 6% molypermaloy for use at Naval Ordnance Labs had been frozen. The contract had gone off to um, Hamilton Watch Company to manufacture an ingot roll to foil and, and get the, their production started. So he was an observer in 1969 on that process. Now, there may have been some interesting further work done on heat treating or surface treatments or something like that, which I wonder about, um, but don't know really anything about. I'd love to know more. Well, well thank you, Barry. I think uh, there's no more open questions right now, and I certainly don't have one. You're way beyond <laughs> where I could ask a sensible question, and people have sending in claps and uh, uh lindsay do you have a comment uh thanks barry really appreciated it and we'll perhaps echo alan's comment it's really exciting to see sort of you know fundamental new knowledge um and space for for a lot of really cool work to be done i'd like to to throw out the question to the whole community it says who's who, who's prepared to uh to help step up and try to, to move these things beyond the lab into the into uh, ap- actual applications. I've got um, people in Denmark who are prepared to work on this kind of stuff to improve the observatory magnetometers, but uh, I'd like to see this kind of stuff go into uh, more modern MT systems as well. I mean, there's three different applications for these kinds of materials. There's the magnetic observatories, there's the MT, and then there's the spacecraft stuff. And um, one more comment generally to make is that I don't think it's going to be possible to get any large company involved in in running with this. It's just the market isn't there for the for the kind of materials involved. Uh, the big players such as uh, vacuum smelts and uh, oh, what's the Japanese company? They're all shutting down. They're closed. They've closed their production on even the the second rate materials. Um, if you want to have low noise sensors going forward i think this group has to somehow get together to do it themselves i, I thought for the mt you've, you've got someone just down the road from you in in adam schultz who'd uh yeah who maybe so is. but he's uh, he's our age too right <laughs> he, he. <Yeah. laughs> um now david is my new young guy bringing into the field but he's completely used up with this just the spacecraft stuff which is growing by like crazy mm-hmm. they're you know, talking about putting hundreds of, of magnetometers into space for arrays and what have you just little things that'll fall out of the sky every year um mt i don't see potential partners there yet well it's uh of course there's andy you know the uh iris uh, mt pool yep and they've, uh, they've. I don't know whether they've filled a the position yet, but they were looking for an MT person. Yeah, well, all this helps. Yeah. Um, they're just, there's, I think there's a manpower shortage. Yeah, 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 certainly. This is absolutely f- f- fabulous, Barry. They've really fundamental work, and it's absolutely fabulous uh, seminar. Um, oh, a question just uh, rolled in from Gunter. I suggested a setup where the permaloid tape was stressed while being annealed inside an oven when magnetic field was either perpendicular or parallel to the tape. Which arrangement should work more favorable 
to decreased coercivity? It all depends on the effect on the alignment because the rest of the parameters aren't going to change much. If you can improve the alignment of the magnetization at the same time as not letting the anisotropy get away from you by doing that, mm -hmm. then you can get an improvement. And, and I'm not going to predict which one's going to be better. It's an experiment that would need to be tried. That said, the temperatures that that are involved in these kinds of heat treatments are so high compared to, to the, uh, um, the, you know, the basically the temperatures are at the point where the yield stress has gone to zero, and so it's it'd be pretty hard to, to to use normal temperatures, heat treatment temperatures to to do this kind of thing. Maybe there's a secondary heat treatment that could be done, say around 400 Celsius or 300 Celsius, where something like this would be possible. I, I've not gone there yet. And uh, just a quick comment from uh, Leo Starovitsky. I would like to explore the possibility of integrating your solution to my project as well. So you've already got a- Okay, you got a fan. Already got <laughs> someone. I think, uh, I think if, if I've got the right Leo, Leo, you're um, a paleomagnetist at uh, Michigan Tech. Yes, I am. Yeah. I'm just okay, working then. on uh, like one one of my projects. It's a uh, uh, magnetometer for paleomagnetic research. So it's uh, in lab magnetometer. And uh, it's so like a spinner like, magnetometer. What? So like a spinner magnetometer? Or? No, better. No? Better. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have a prototype, but um, okay, I have some issues and. Uh, uh, my, uh, my major issue now it's uh, sensors because um, I need uh, special configuration uh, and it should be um, okay. I didn't find anything better than Fluxgate, and that's why I thought uh, that uh, Med Glass or something like this will work better. But uh, after your presentation, I will consider uh, another material for core. Well, I would suggest the Michigan isn't very far away from Iowa. And uh, a lot of this work is being done in the in Iowa City at David Miles mm -hmm. Labs. You should maybe get in contact with him directly or some or some of his people. Mm -hmm. In short, uh, and get uh, David bypass Miles, me. You told David me. Miles, yeah. Okay. David Miles, he's a professor of uh, assistant professor of physics there. Okay. Uh, David Miles, are you? I yeah, I will try to find him. Okay. Well. Again, Barry, absolutely wonderful. Thanks very much. And thank you to the audience. This has been a wonderful uh, interactive dialogue. And the questions show the uh, excitement and uh, interest in, in your topic, Barry. So Good. Uh, this recording will be up on, um, up on MTNet in, in the YouTube channel in a couple of hours. And Barry, I think, I hope you'll send me your, your uh, PDF. So I'll get that up on the MTNet. Okay, one last little note. This is a paper in prep in, in um, preparation. It'll probably. I'm hoping it'll get to uh, to the um, EGUGI journal with Valerie Korpanov, editor, uh, uh, pretty soon. Uh, most of it's written, uh, so uh, all, all of this material will be, including the historical material, will be in that paper, and also uh, an English language translation of that 1935 paper, which I've now completed and it's in its publication already brilliant absolutely brilliant so thanks again barry and uh goodbye everybody and hope to see those of you interested in in magnetotellurics next uh, wednesday for our final mnr of the season bye now bye barry